Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for this exciting presentation today. We're thrilled and honored to be hearing from Burton Catledge, CEO, founder of Launch on Demand Corporation. He'll be sharing the unique qualities and capabilities for Northeast Florida to support the space industry. There's a lot going on in the county. Clay County continues to experience tremendous growth. Construction of phase two of the Expressway remains on track for completion in 2025-26. The county is making great progress on construction of the various connector roads throughout the community as well. Our economy is recovering well. There were 263 building permits issued in August. This was the highest number of permits issued in a single month dating back to October of 2005. Home sale prices are up 23.4% year over year for the county and the unemployment rates are back down to 3.9. This is 1.1% lower than the state average. And last week, the Clay County Development Authority was awarded $300,000 through the Defense Infrastructure Grant Program to be used for maintenance facilities at Camp Landing Joint Training Center. And the Clay EDC was also awarded $65,000 through the Defense Reinvestment Grant to develop our strategic sites inventory. This will further our development along the First Coast Expressway. Funding will also be used to create an interactive GIS analysis application for site evaluation. The construction of Atlantis Drive through to the Challenger Center site is under construction and slated for completion early of 2022. Niagara Bottling is the new beverage bottling plant under construction in the Challenger Center. You can see a footprint um, being poured of concrete today. They have hired a plant manager and been recruiting for various positions ranging from high level management to engineering and operations. They intend to be training in November of this year and the plant will be open January of 2022. A full list of positions is available at Niagara Bottling at their website at careers.niagarawater.com. Also, the new Baptist Hospital on Fleming Island is moving along. The total investment has increased to over 235 million. They have over 200 construction workers on site daily and they continue to source a, a host of local products and services. We thank them for their investment. They also have 235 Baptist employees now on location and will hire another 400 before they open. And Orange Park Medical Center is reporting a drop in COVID numbers, which is great news. They are currently hiring for 168 open positions. They have a new Health Park doctor's office building under construction on the Orange Park Medical Campus and slated for occupancy second quarter of 2022. They're also constructing a new ER in Middleburg at the, Blant, at the corner of Blanding Boulevard and Everett Avenue. And that's uh, projected to be open fourth quarter of 2022. Also on Camp Blanding, Camores is building a $93 million processing plant to support their mining operations. And they are currently hiring for related operation and engineering positions. Um, Florida Power and Light is looking to expand their solar farm footprint with two new projects adjacent to the current Magnolia Springs project south of Green Coast Springs. They're also planning a regional service headquarters on the new property. It'll be a base for 12 high-level engineering and management positions for the Northeast Florida solar sites. And our partners at Career Source um, Northeast Florida will be hosting a virtual hiring fair September 28th from 10 to 1. If you're interested in participating as an employer or candidate, please visit their website, careersourcenortheastflorida.com. There's a lot of great professional opportunities in the community. We encourage all to apply and seek out. But on to what our program is today. Um, we're honored to have Burton Catledge, retired U.S. Air Force Colonel and CEO of Launch On Demand Corporation, which is the industry leader in efficient and effective services for the space launch industry. The company enables safe and continuous based launch and recovery operations that allow citizens to operate, allow clients to operate based on their own business decision rather than inflexible sub-optimized windows. Prior to founding Launch On Demand, 
Uh, he was the commander of the U.S. Air Force's 45th Operations Group, the 45th Space Wing, with operations at Patrick Air Force Base, Cape Canaveral, and Kennedy Space Center. He has extensive knowledge and operational experience at both the United States Eastern and Western Ranges and was instrumental in leading groundbreaking launch support services for new commercial launch customers on the Eastern Range, including names like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Moon Express. Burton was also director of the Cyber and Space Programs at the Department of Defense, or DOD, at the Pentagon, where he was responsible for budgeting, acquisition, and procurement of multi-billion dollar state-of-the-art IT and equipment systems to include support for all DOD classified space programs. Burton has has productive relationships across the United States Air Force, Space Florida, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, National or Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Commerce, and other, other industry stakeholders. We thank you for your service and welcome, Burton. We're so glad to have you with us today. Thanks, JJ. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, be part of this today. I've been excited about it uh, since I got to speak with Laura probably about a couple last month. Um, uh, believe it or not, I spend an awful lot of time thinking about Clay County. Um, and so uh, I'd like to kind of share those thoughts with you in a few slides that I put together um, because uh, what I was explaining to JJ is, you know, there is a, there's a significant growth opportunity in space right now. And um, as most of those who have bought a house before everyone know or started a business, it's all about location, location, location. And um, as we kind of go through uh, this, this presentation, um, I want to try to convince uh, the people on the line that Clay County has a location uh, like no other um, in, in the world, really. Um, you may not necessarily think that, but my goal for this presentation is to come to the end of it and you go, oh, my goodness, we are... Um, you know, Camores is not the only person that, you know, has a mining uh, operation in Clay County. Uh, you're probably, you're sitting on a gold mine yourself. So I am going to start with some slides. Um, I, I love uh, interaction. So uh, ask questions. Um, I have a few funny stories, but I won't, I won't do it unless you ask me to, or it gets really quiet. Um, but um, thanks again for, for giving me this, this opportunity. Um, I'm going to try this. Can somebody give me a thumbs up um, that they can see my slides? All righty, there we go. Okay, so as JJ mentioned, um, I retired from the Air Force in 2018 um, and I started looking at this burgeoning uh, space industry and, and all the requirements that would probably need to be um, accounted for. Um, and we quickly came to the conclusion that the underlying infrastructure that's required to get to and from orbit um, safely does not exist. Um, Cape Canaveral um, and its sister out on the West Coast were designed with the by NASA primarily in the Department of Defense to support things like uh, uh, Gemini, and Apollo, Mercury programs, and the shuttles. Um, the incoming commercial demand. Um, is going to far surpass uh, what is currently existing at these federal facilities. And so it's my contention that unless uh, other parts of the country uh, starts to pay attention and, and find out ways in which they can contribute, uh, we may in fact um, hamper this $1 trillion industry. And I said $1 trillion, uh, believe it or not, that is a low number. Um, I've seen estimates somewhere in the $3 trillion economy. So here we go. Okay, uh, the coming space boom. Uh, what you see right there in the top, the black and white is what we call, uh, affectionately called old space. Uh, those are the giants whose shoulders we're standing on right now. Um, down below that in the color, you're seeing the, the new giants uh, in the form of uh, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, uh, and a few names maybe you haven't heard of. Uh, all of them uh, are very uh, well-to-do in terms of uh, financial and capital. Um, and so while the previous old space was driven by governments, uh, the future new space industry is going to be driven by uh, billionaires and is already being uh, shaped that way. 
there are things that we are finding out literally on a weekly basis uh, that we can do in space that we uh, did not know uh, would have some advantages. And uh, one of your native sons uh, made in space is named Andrew Rush. Um, Andrew Rush gave a presentation earlier this week that I went to at uh, Jacksonville and talked about Zeblan. Most of you probably don't know what Zeblan is, but Zeblan is a fiber optic cable that is made in space. And because it's made in space, it can actually doesn't have the gravitational forces that are operating when it's on, on Earth. And therefore, what happens is it constricts uh, the light going through. So when you create Zeblan or fiber optics in space, you get more throughput because there are less permutations in the fiber optic. That's just one example. Uh, there's, there's, there's thousands um, of, of capabilities beyond Tang and WD-40 and Velcro that you're probably familiar with. Uh, capabilities that have economic um, potential. Um, and we think that these industries are gonna fuel the largest economic boom in human history. So the boom is coming. I don't think there's a question. The question is now, where is that boom gonna happen? And it's gonna be my contention that it's probably not gonna happen on a military base. So what are we talking about here? Uh, so you can see the date as of August. Right now in 2020, uh, well, as of 2020, uh, we were at about a $447 billion economy, okay? That is incredibly significant when you try to compare it to anything else. Also, when you consider you know, how it is um, really narrowed down into a very few uh, cases, um, you can see right there that commercial industries are dwarfing the US government budgets, so 49%. Um, and the government spending is, is reducing because the government is realizing that the pace at which this commercial industry is growing, uh, not even the DOD and NASA could keep up with that. And you're starting to see that uh, play out uh, in real time uh, with, uh, in the news. So 447 billion, that's a 220. And so when you start talking about a $1 trillion economy, uh, that's just really a hop, skip and a jump. And we're just starting to see the beginning stages of that. I want to talk a little bit about geography because in this case, geography is more important than technology. Um, and so this is a list of, you know, someone asked me, okay, well, if you had to build a spaceport, what would be the ideal attributes? Well, first off, you need a day of launch service. That means that you need to be able to control who comes in the airspace, the maritime space, make sure you don't hit anything on orbit. Um, and then in many cases, recover. Uh, without hitting uh, something. Um, so we call those day of launch services. Um, the DOD right now calls those uh, ranges. So there's uh, a range on the East Coast down at Cape Canaveral, and there's a range on the West Coast at, uh, at uh, Vandenberg. So launch on demand's primary bread and butter is providing day of launch services anywhere in the world all the time on a cost-effective basis. So in addition to having day of launch services, you also need to have access to multiple orbits. Um, JJ and I were talking briefly about um, Starlink. Uh, Starlink is going to go into, um, which is being launched by SpaceX, is in a different orbit than maybe your direct TV, which is in a geostationary orbit. Uh, so you can kind of think of those as you know different roads to space, if you will. Um, so you don't want to have just one road. You want to have multiple roads to space because each satellite, uh, to really get the, um, the value of the satellite, it really depends upon what orbits it's in, and each orbit really is is, is unique. Um, you want to be close to water um, because people don't live on water typically. Um, and when we launch, if something uh, goes uh, uh, sideways that day uh, and debris falls down, we don't want it to land on people or property. So we, as a, as a general rule, we like to launch near water. Uh, but interestingly, uh, we're now bringing things back. Uh, in some cases, boosters, in some cases, passengers. Uh, so we want to recover them. Uh, so you can't just do this out in the middle of nowhere. You want people to be able to have be close to water and close to land simultaneously, which may sound uh, like an oxymoron, but in fact, um, you'll see why that's important. Um, most people are very familiar with the activity with a launch. Um, it's a pretty significant emotional event. Uh, what they don't see is all of the activity that leads up to a launch, which is the movement of the payloads, uh, the fuels, the processing, uh, and 
To do that, um, you need to have access to seaports, uh, airports, and rail ports, so multimodal transportation. You also need to have proximity to commodities like fuel, power, and water. Um, your neighbor, uh, Florida Power and Light, uh, provides an awful lot of that, but you need to have access to pipelines and things because these you know, types of rockets and their satellites don't use um, normal fuels that you would be associated with. And primarily, they use either a, um, an LN2 or liquid oxygen, or in some cases, uh, kerosene, which is RP1. So the types of fuels that you need are somewhat different than what's uh, available. And then finally, and it's number seven, this is not priority, but you need to attract human capital. Most of the spaceports that you, we're going to talk about here in a little bit are in places that uh, struggle to attract human capital. Most people do not want to call Truth or Consequences New Mexico home or Brownsville, Texas home or um, you know uh, Oklahoma home. Uh, typically, people like to have a, a football team and a standard of living that is uh, commensurate with what they're doing. Uh, and these are high paying jobs. And so, you know, to attract people who are making six figure incomes, you need to have the um, the environment that uh, will make them want to stay. Um, so those are my seven lists of ideal uh, geographic spaceport attributes. And I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation explaining how Clay County has all seven of those. And then maybe I'll spend some time talking about how nowhere else in the world has these things. Um, so it's about location, location, location. Okay. These are a list of the 18 uh, FAA licensed spaceports in the United States. Um, so the spaceports that you see right here, in some cases, are do not have a day of launch service. So already, you know, they're more of a, a business park than they are of launching rockets. So Colorado Air and Spaceport um, and a couple of places in Houston, probably it's unlikely they will ever launch um, from there, um, primarily because uh, they're not next to water. Um, another, and then they don't have some of those ideal attributes. Some of the other uh, FAA licensed spaceports that you see are actually uh, co-located with a, a DOD or a NASA facility. So while they're commercial, they're licensed under commercial, they are really a military base. Um, so if you see right there in South Texas as a launch site, that's where Elon Musk is building uh, his next uh, rocket. Um, that is not going to be on the military base. It is close to water, but he's not going to have access to all the orbits that he would normally have when he's in Florida, because in order to get to them, he would have to overfly land. So he's going to be somewhat restricted from launching from South Texas. So what you then have is you have sort of this Florida centric um, place because we're near the water. Uh, you can get to all the orbits, uh, multimodal transportation. Um, there's only one problem. Uh, they're all centered around Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral are out of space, pun intended. They do not have the geographic area to support the commercial uh, demand. In addition to that, it is actually a military base. So launching you know, uh, a commercial satellite on a military base, those commercial operators are, um, have, to be, uh, have to comply with all the military requirements associated with that. Um, so we talk about Cape Canaveral and we talk about Kennedy Space Center, um, but for those that have never been there, it is a military base. It is run by a military officer, it's a military base, and they have military rules. So not everybody can go on there. Where do you go? Well, before we get to that part of it, I want to sort of deep dive into, you may think, well, uh, you know, what, what do you need at these air and space ports? Um, this is probably the most compelling diagram. Some, some people may find it, uh, try to equate it with an airport and a spaceport are, are one and the same. Um, I will tell you that they are not. Um, just as a a train station and a and a uh, a a, um, a port are different. They might end in port, but what they have and what they need are significantly different. These are the components, the main components 
of an air and spaceport. And they are designed to make sure that you can get to and get back from space. Um, some of these are, you know, are, are pretty critical, um, like the fuels. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through uh, where these components live right now in terms of where you are in Clay County. Most people are familiar with a point uh, where you can have a spaceport, whether it's Cape Canaveral or whether it's uh, White Sands Missile Range. What we are proposing uh, um, is that we establish a regional spaceport development strategy. Um, just north of you in Canmid County, uh, you have a vertical launch uh, site. Uh, they are probably within about a month of getting their vertical license. Uh, moving down south, you have Crawford Diamond, which is owned by FPL that has access to different types of transportation, primarily rail, but also the ports. Cecil Spaceport uh, is the third largest runway in Florida and already has their horizontal launch license and has been advertising um, the ability to attract horizontal customers. And then finally, you've got Clay County, uh, which, you know, the, the jewel in Clay County is Camp Blanding. Um, and Camp Blanding is accustomed to blowing things up, uh, which is very important uh, because what you have from a rocket launch is really a controlled explosion. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dive into that just for just a second. Well, no, I'll wait till I get to the Clay County slide. Um, these are all within 60 uh, miles of each other. Um, and all of them have unique attributes that fit into the larger regional spaceport strategy. So uh, what we'll talk about first is Camp Blanding. So most people are, as I mentioned earlier, familiar with the rocket launches. What they're not very familiar with is all the things that need to happen before a, a launch a rocket launches. One of the main things that needs to happen is every single one of those engines that is on that rocket has to be tested on an engine test stand. So um, the Falcon 9 has nine Merlin engines. Every single one of those engines has to be tested before it's strapped to a booster and launched. Um, if you're familiar with the Starship, the Starship actually has 37. So having engine test stands to run these engines, even if they've already flown, has to be done every single flight. Uh, there are no commercially available engine test stands um, in the US right now. Um, so having a place where you can test rocket engines near Camp Blanding would feed not only the regional spaceport development in North Florida, South Georgia, but it would also be a feeder for Cape Canaveral and, and Kennedy Space Center. Um, th the second part of this is security. Um, the, we're no, we have to operate in an environment now where security is baked into everything we do. Uh, you can't go in and sprinkle it later on. Um, some of the capabilities that we are developing in our, our rocket technology is very sensitive and we want to keep it in the hands of, of people that we call friends. Um, so there has to be additional security associated with you know, how you develop this spaceport. Just so happens you already have transportation uh, going to uh, Camp Landing, liquid oxygen and fuel, that's what you need in order to run the rockets. And uh, you also currently on Camp Landing proper, you already have a solid rocket motor storage area. There's two types of rockets motors, primarily there's liquid and there's solids. Uh, rocket providers use both of them. Um, so what we are not proposing is we build all of this onto Camp Landing, but we are proposing that as part of the buffer area and as part of the economic opportunity zone that's just north and west of Camp Landing, that that would be an area where we would build out these capabilities. And as I already mentioned, they would feed both the northern Florida, southern Georgia strategy but also could be and should be leveraged to feed um, the additional growth that's happening at Cape Canaveral. Uh, so being having access to rail is, is a unique quality of Camp Blanding. Crawford Diamond uh, has its own unique qualities that can be uh, considered as part of that. As I mentioned, they have access to the port, uh, they have access to rail, uh, there's two major highways. Um, I, as I was talking to JJ uh, before the presentation, the estimates are there will probably there will be about fifty thousand 
five zero with three zeros behind it, satellites uh, launched in the next uh, three to five years. Um, there's no place to store them. Um, they actually have some pretty unique requirements for storing satellites. Uh, they often have to be tested themselves before they are attached to the rocket. And so uh, what you have are basically satellite processing and storage. Um, and what we believe is going to happen is that these places, you know, someone in the company called it a, uh, a satellite hotel. Um, that's probably not too far of a stretch. If you've gone to Crawford Diamond, it is a great location uh, because um, it's, it's expandable. And you can grow that satellite processing and that storage right there and then use the rails and the roads and the ports to move those satellites around. Um, you also could use that location as for fuel pipelines in order to fuel um, the different locations that we're going to talk about next. Incidentally, anytime you see a check mark next to uh, one of the um, nomenclatures, it means that that's already there. Um, you don't have to go do it. You may need to improve it or modify it, but it's already there. Uh, Cecil Spaceport, once again, I mean, a huge advocate of Cecil Spaceport. Um, they have the third largest runway. They already have their horizontal license. Um, so what we need to look at is how do we get customers to come to Cecil? Um, and these are some of the capabilities that we would need to establish at Cecil physically. Um, there, at some point in time, you're going to want to mate the rocket with the payload, and then you're going to want to take off and you're going to want to be able to do it safely and recover safely. So you're going to need some of these services that come about. But once again, the fact that Cecil already has its license, the fact that the, the um, you know, they already have a, a team that is looking really hard at bringing in some of these other capabilities uh, are, are pretty extraordinary. And then finally, you've got um, Camden. Uh, it's got a yellow check mark next to it because it doesn't have his vertical spaceport yet. Um, I will tell you that uh, there is still a lot of work that has to be done at Camden. Um, they started this process about seven years ago um, to get what they call an environmental impact statement. I'm sure everybody groans or cringes when I say EIS. Um, it's taken about seven years for uh, Camden to get its EIS. Um, I think that's going to have to be some additional modifications to the EIS in the form of an, uh, an EA uh, to get some of the larger rockets um, and to get to some of the orbits that um, are going to be needed. But when they do get their license, keep in mind, this will be the only commercially vertical spaceport license on the East Coast. That's it. And anybody that wants to try this again, say, you know, somewhere else has to start and they will be done in somewhere around seven years. So uh, Camden still needs some work, but they're seven years ahead of everybody else. Um, so I think uh, despite some of the work that needs to be done, it still represents an incredible opportunity. So if you go back to my previous slide of the air and space components, uh, components of an air and space port, I put check marks toward things that are in, already in uh, these locations. Um, and as I've already mentioned also is the commercial demand is just that. It wants, they want to operate on a commercial facility. They want to use commercial services and more importantly, they want to move at the speed of commerce. Uh, they don't want to move at the speed of government, which, you know, for, for all intents and purposes right now, represents the Department of Defense and NASA. I took one more step at this uh, because, it, the, you know, whenever someone's there, okay, that looks great, Burton, but how do you pay for this? <laughs> so I tried to, once again, leverage some of the unique characteristics of Florida. Florida is the only state... Uh, that I am aware of that recognizes space as a mode of transportation, which is pretty interesting because um, as because of that, there are uh, FDOT funds that are available and, and currently put to use um, for space. Um, we also know that in the news, uh, there is a uh, uh, about a $1 trillion push to build uh, the infrastructure in the United States. Um, and many of that, a lot, I think some of that will go to rails, roads, and, and airports. So you've got federal dollars that will be flowing to the state of Florida um, that could be leveraged in order to make this regional spaceport concept work. Um, 
I kind of got ahead of myself. There's state funding as well. Um, but the key to the state funding piece is they have to, it should be revenue generating. In other words, while you can use taxpayer money to do these sort of things, I think the more important part is you have to build out the business case to say if the state invests, you know, $10 million, that its rate of return will be the following. And so um, it's not just a, a one and done, but it's actually looking at the business case. So we think the business case is very strong to use taxpayer money um, to uh, provide a very um, reasonable return on investment. Um, I tried to find the county piece um, to go forward because I think the counties are very, if you, re if, you, if you look at all the locations, each one of those locations is in its own county. Um, and I think the counties need to be participating in, in moving forward with this. Um, and they are typically used to writing contracts, uh, building leases and things like that. But once again, we have to build out the business case because there should be a return on investment. And then finally, there's a significant amount of private equity funding uh, available for these sort of things. Um, uh, we see that on a daily basis. Um, it's What's happening is we call them the big B billionaires, the ones that you're familiar with. And most of the little B billionaires want to be big B billionaires. And right now, you know, the way that that happens or the way that people make their, their, their little B become a big B is through space. And, uh, you know, we, we get approached often about how can I get involved in space? Um, because it's still somewhat of a, a closed um, uh, group. It's not quite hit its stride yet. But there's quite a bit of private equity funding um, that we would leverage and we would try to figure out what would be the best use of those equity funding. So I, I call it a stone soup uh, regional spaceport funding strategy because it ties everybody together under a larger um, umbrella of what we're trying to do um, and how what the end result is. And at the end of the day, it's about how do we create a revenue producing industry uh, here in North Florida. So uh, in addition to how do you pay for this, uh, you know, I don't want to just give a great presentation. I'd like to give some sort of next steps. There's two parts of this. One of them is the feasibility study, which is where you go out and you identify the areas in which you would, and costing information of how would you build the payload processing? You know, where would that be located? You know, could you put it here on Cecil or is it better at Crawford Diamond? You know, where would you put, you know, the engine test stands? What sort of fuels would you need? What are sort of the, you know, those sort of constraints? So there's a, what we call a feasibility study. Um, and uh, that is very important because um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to go off and sort of, you know, put lots of money to an idea without doing a due diligence. And so the first step is to do the feasibility study. The second part um, is to avoid doing the build it and they will come. Uh, we call it, you know, instead of the field of dreams, we call it the dream of fields. Uh, the dream of fields is you come and we will build it. Um, and you come and we will build it means we've got to go out and we've got to talk to the customers and say, okay, Give us some insight into you know how you're going to be testing your engines. What's your what's your rate? You know how often are you going to do that? What's your throughput? Because most of these companies are not actually publishing what their manifest and what their demands are. It's still pretty close. And so you've got to go out to the rocket builders. Um, incidentally, you may not know this. There's about 120 rocket builders in the world. 120 of them. Uh, so all of them, I need a place to launch. Uh, and so if they need a place to launch, uh, those seven ideal attributes that I mentioned um, are very uh, relevant to uh, their business case. Um, so we need to be, we need, it's not a one or the other, it's a yes and both. You have to do both. Otherwise, you'll end up with field of dreams. And what we said earlier is we want a dream of fields. And so with that, uh, that would that be my last slide. And hopefully I got sort of the, the people just jumping up and down, ready to ask questions um, because I'm going to stop sharing here so you, we, can, we can see each other. And um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the new person on the block, if you wouldn't mind just kind of unmuting and turn on your, your video, um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions uh, you have, how I came to this realization. Um, funny stories I might have, whatever you want to talk about. JJ, I'll, 
I'll give the floor uh, to whoever uh, wants to step up. Any questions out there from anyone? Put it in the chat if you want. If you have a question, JJ, I'll throw one out. Bill Larson, Vetra Tech. Hey, um, vertical versus horizontal. Where do you think the uh, the area is going? I've been out to Cecil several times, and they're obviously pushing the horizontal piece. Um, but uh, do you foresee that as being since everything's been vertical to date? Do you see that in the next five years, ten years, where the horizontal picks up versus the vertical? Thanks. Yes. So it's a business case strategy. So for horizontal, for the most part, uh, they are able to, so we call it throw weight or kilograms to orbit. Um, and because of the horizontal has a much lower uh, payload capacity than a vertical launch. And so what you do is what you see is that the horizontal customers tend to be those that have very specific orbits and very specific timing. Um, and so I don't think that they're necessarily in competition. I think they're complementary. But I will offer that horizontal and vertical both have the same problem. Um, they just approach it differently. They all have to get through the airspace, um, the maritime space, and the orbital space. Um, moving offshore, if you will, you know, on a on a carrier aircraft does not necessarily solve many of the problems. Um, as some people think people, you know, we've talked to some rocket builders that said, I'm going to go out to the middle of the ocean. I'm going to, I'm going to launch. Um, it's not quite that easy. Um, you can't, you can't do a controlled explosion and not involve, you know, safety. So, so I think both of them are going to be necessary, um, because there's no way right now with the number of vertical, uh, rocket builders that they can, they can handle the, uh, the throughput that's coming. So for the near term, uh, you're going to have both of them. So did that answer your question, William? Yes, thanks. So Burton, a uh, question I have is, how can we best position the Reynolds Industrial Park Port and Airport and Keystone Heights Airport, uh, south end of Blanding, which has 2,400 acres, uh, to capitalize on the opportunities that are coming? Sure. So um, Keystone Heights is, once again, pretty unique. Um you, you have to go back to this idea of the multimodal transportation. So where I live, I live in Cape Canaveral. There's probably not a day that goes by that someone's not flying in a very large aircraft that has, you know, either payloads or parts or rockets or things in there. So what you would need, you know, is you would need to have basically be able to allow the customers to fly in and, and, and bring in the, their equipment. Um, and that's almost on a recurring basis. So um, we don't even have enough airlift uh, to support that. So one of the aircraft that a lot of the rocket builders use is uh, it's called an Antonov 225, which if you've ever seen one of them, you probably will never forget it because it's, it's huge. huge. So they bring that in. So I'm not suggesting that that would always be the type of aircraft you would bring in, but that's the size of the aircraft that they're bringing in C-17s, Antonovs, um, some cases C-5s. Um, what you're also seeing, you know, amazingly enough, is the Department of Defense doesn't even like launching from a Department of Defense facility. Um, they are trying to figure out how to launch from from other places um, because uh, you know there's a variety of reasons, but some of it has to do with redundancy and, and customers. But so I think if you look at Keystone and say that's you know that's one of our you know our our you know air hubs or air pods a pods um, in addition to maybe um, Cecil uh, that would be a very good use of, of Keystone Heights. What's the typical runway length that they need? I want to say 10,000 feet, but um, I think that's sort of average. Um, you know, I think there are some that can take off, you know, in shorter distances, uh, longer distances. I don't know, remember how long Keystone Heights, I don't remember if it was 10,000. I don't think it was, but I it's think nice. there was a discussion about making it longer. Um, but really, I think the access, if I remember correctly, you know, the access to Camp Blanding um, or the, the relative close location to Camp Blanding makes it a pretty unique place. So, you know, the engines Absolutely. that are being created or built are not being built here. They're mostly being built out in California. So, you know, the way I see this is you would fly it in from California into Keystone Heights. You would then transport it over to Camp Blanding. You put it on an engine test stand. That engine test stand would test out the rocket and then it would take it either to Cecil uh, to be uh, mated onto the rocket or the, to Camden to be baited on the rocket there. And so that's how I would see that kind of, you know, logistics flow happening. 
Thanks, Burton. We have a question from Bonnie. You yeah, can go hi, ahead Bonnie. And ask Bonnie. I'm interested in becoming a, <clears throat> a service provider. Um, how do I go about doing that? Because Camp Blanding and Cecil Field are 15 minutes from my office. Yeah. Uh, so I get, yeah, tell me a little bit about your background. I, um, IT support and, you know, computer supplies. Oh, yeah. Computers, technology, pretty much. Yeah. So, in fact, you know, the <laughs> what's interesting is that um, the the I'm trying to think of how to say this correctly. Um, most people do not realize the requirements that are on IT. This is a true story. I'm just going to tell a story. We had our computers go down once during a launch when I was in the military. And when it happened, we were all scrambling to try and find who had used the fax machine last and uh, what was the phone number. Um, in fact, that was my biggest gripe. Of all the things that I had to deal with on launching a rocket, it was the likelihood that my computers would go down. So, so um, in fact, one of the co-founders of Launch On Demand is actually the guy that I used to hold responsible for the things that fall apart. So uh, uh, JJ and Laura know how to get in touch with me. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, 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 um, it is one of those things that just, you know, never, never gets old. Any other questions? I, I did want to say one thing, um, because, uh, I think, uh, let's see from Cecil, there is a, uh, a rock engine test stand at Cecil right now. Um, but it's relatively small compared to the types of engine test stands that are needed. Um, I'll just give you a, a G whiz, um, SpaceX right now does most of their engine testing in McGregor, Texas, um, before they come out here to Cape Canaveral. Um, they have their engine test stands running about 18 hours a day. Um, and, uh, they are expanding that, um, pretty much, uh, I think every, every year. The point of that is it's not just a one type of engine. Each type of engine uses a different type of fuel, different size, you know, different components. So it's kind of like, you know, you would, you know, you, you can't, it, it would work in a few situations, but if you really want to capture a percentage of that $447 billion, uh, the types of testing you're going to need to do is, is much more significant and you're going to need a location like Camp Landing. Thanks, Burton. We, we have another question from Robin with Career Source. Go ahead, Robin. Hey, Robin. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know what type of workforce needs ah, you first see. It. So, so Animal Planet had a advertisement about five years ago, and they said that the fact that it was Animal Planet surprisingly human. Um, I will tell you, rockets surprisingly human. Um, it, it is absolutely the thing that is going to uh, make or break a location. And it's not what you would think. Uh, most of it is very skilled labor, welders, electricians, uh, metal workers, uh, heavy industrial, those kind of guys. Most people you know, go, oh, well, I don't have a, you know, a PhD in aerospace engineering. Um, I suspect, and I have seen it, you know, some of the bigs would trade in aerospace engineering for about five or 10 guys that know how to weld um, without mm -hmm. a problem. Uh, and they would pay them handsomely. So um, he's not, I don't know, know if he's on the line right now, uh, but we talked with uh, Tom Bryan, uh, USFG, U, UCFJ, I think that's right, um, in UNF. Uh, we really think that to establish a pipeline between those two schools directly into the space industry, and once again, these are these are you know six figure jobs. Um, and uh, already down here in in Brevard County, uh, there's not enough of those types of skilled labors. <clears throat> so I would try to keep your mind on the idea of skilled labor, um, and not so much you know that that PhD credentialed person, um, because we could find those PhD credentialed people anytime. It's the welders that were really struggling, or that are, that are really driving this. So does airframe and power plant translate well into the skills absolutely. That's needed? Absolutely. Absolutely. A, a and P licensing. Um, absolutely. So um, that's how I started off. And originally was I, I was a, I'm an airplane mechanic. Same sort of things. You know, these things are dangerous. Be careful. Um, and uh, safety is always, you know, part of the culture and uh, testing. So a lot of avia a lot of the aviation principles 
are finding their way into the space industry. So it would, if you, you can go back and forth between the aviation and the space industry re- with relative ease right now. Burton, can you talk about back office operations like the, that we have existing facilities in Orange Park? And then I want to turn it over to Sarah Campbell, um, town manager of Orange Park. Yeah, sure. Can you give me a little bit of back? What's at Orange Park? So Orange Park, uh, obviously town of Orange Park is right at the south end of NAS Jacks, but north um, east Clay County. Um, we have a lot of contractors um, that work for NAS Jacks and government contractors in the area. We have a lot of uh, Class A office space and mm-hmm. facilities uh, that could be beneficial for any back office operations. Sure. So you probably, um, I don't remember if you go look back at that diagram, I'm not going to pull it up, but office space is pretty, pretty, pretty spectacular uh, importance. Um, true story. Once again, story time. Um, when SpaceX lands a booster, there's a lot of people that land that work at Cape Canaveral. And because of the hazard of returning a booster, those <clears> people cannot go to work. So a couple lessons learned. Do not land your booster in the middle of an office park. Step one. Um, two, don't put your rocket launch facility on a military base. And so those people, when they can't go to work, they can't go to work. Um, and many of those people are working in classified. So it, it, as, I, as, I, as I've thought through this regional concept, separating the administrative from the operational is, is not just a neat kind of thing. It's absolutely essential because both of them need to do. And so they're suboptimized right now at Cape Canaveral because of that one reason. And and if you saw the overlapping circles right now uh, with the, uh, the debris contours, if a rocket were to explode, um, I don't think having an office in, on Cape Canaveral is a good idea at all. Um, you need to separate these things. So if you have access to office space, um, I would definitely try to you know, keep that away from the operational <clears throat> part of this. Does that, does that answer your question, JJ? Sure, go ahead, sir. Hey, Burton. Um, so as a city manager, my question is really about all of the local governments in our region and how we can best support this endeavor. Is it through just understanding what type of zoning needs you have, or is it making sure that ancillary support things, hotels, restaurants, gas stations are, are nearby? What, are you, what, is local, what can local government do to make this successful? So, so let me, let me, uh, I'll, let's, let's start with the bill payer, the guy who's got the wallet. Okay. Um, the billionaires. So, so I've said this and I still believe this space is going to follow the modes of transportation that we've seen in the past. And they're going to follow there. They may be different, but it's going to have the same characteristics. And we've just seen it this week. So it used to be governments and then it was now it's private industry, private commercial customers, but they are billionaires. And then all of a sudden, you know, eventually you're going to get to the point where you're going to have people living and working in space, which is Jeff Bezos. So right now, what you have is almost, well, it is perfect, meaning that the people who are funding these activities have a standard of living that is just not here at Cape Canaveral. It's not their true consequences to Mexico. So they want the restaurants. They want the Ruth Chris Steakhouse. They want the Ritz Carlton. They want to have, you know, the... The Jacksonville Jaguars, I hope they're able to pull, you know, some some things out, but they want those venues. So even so, so what one of the customers that we work with is in the space tourism business. And what they said was people don't buy these things in one tickets. They buy them in multiple tickets. And so what does the family do when, you know, the person's getting that, you know, once in a lifetime ride to space? You know, I would want them to go see, go to the Louis Vuitton store. Um, I would want to put them in a really nice high-end hotel. I want to make, make sure that the meals that they, you know, they come to enjoy are, you know, of sufficient quality that they would anticipate. So there's an entire, um, I don't want to say entertainment industry, because it's not entertainment, um, com- uh, uh, hospitality business that gets built off of this. I just kind of talked about the operational part of this, but the other environment that goes around with it um, is, 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 um, is going to be just as important. I don't, Sarah, I don't know if I answered your question completely because I don't understand enough of the zoning requirements, but what I do understand yeah. is that, you know, getting, I'll tell you another story. So the person who does all the blue origin development um, and I sat down when I, when I first took over and he said, you got to understand these guys do not, these guys came from Silicon Valley who are doing these companies. They don't care about money. They care about speed. Okay. Velocity. 
They're not talking about money is not what they're, they're after. They've already made their billions of dollars. They want speed and they will pay for speed. So, so for instance, I think in Crawford Diamond, you know, one of their attributes is you can get a building permit in 30 days. <laughs> Good luck with that on a military base. Um, so, you know, they want to move fast and money and they, they will pay to move fast. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at, you know, from your zoning department and things like that, you know, if you're able to sort of plus up those bodies that are helping that go faster, you'll make them very happy. They're not necessarily concerned about saving money. Thank Strange you. saying that. The rest of us do, but they don't. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. We're so grateful for your continued support and engagement with economic development efforts in Clay County. Uh, we appreciate you tremendously and look forward to our next engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Burton. Thank you. Thank you.